In the history of the Marconi Company from 1874 to 1937 and after the Second World War until the company ceased operating in 1998. Marconi was born in Bologna in 1874, the second son of a very rich Italian farmer called uh, Ambronzo. Uh, he had an elder brother called Alfonso and uh, he was educated at Bologna University uh, up to the age of 18, having previously been in the United Kingdom from the age of 12 to ensure that he was speaking English as well as possible. At the University of Bologna he met a lot of very learned uh, scientists and he learned a lot from them but he himself academically failed all his examinations. However, listening to the scientists alongside him, he put together what he and we now consider wireless. And the shot you see here is the shot of the first piece of equipment that Marconi brought to the United Kingdom uh, when Sir William Priest was able to give him a little talk. This is the house in Bologna called Sasso Marconi is the name of the village and this is the house where Marconi himself was born. He had a little office up on the second floor and it was there he carried out a number of experiments. One day of which of course he said to his mother take this loudspeaker into your kitchen and let me know if you hear anything coming out of the loudspeaker. Well, the Villa Griffoni was a, a very big mansion, something like 18 rooms in it, and the kitchen was a very long way away. But there were no wires connected, and Mother came rushing back to uh, Guglielmo's office and said, I can hear something coming out here, a lot of funny noises. Well, that was the Morse key, which Marconi was using in his office, Send your signal to the kitchen. Mark only realised at that point that at the age of 18 that he had perfected something which we now call wireless. To prove a point, Mark only asked his elder brother, Alfonso, if he would go into the family orchard about a mile away and take with him the loudspeaker and a gun. The gun was used if Alfonso was hearing the Morse keys coming through the loudspeaker. Well, off went Alfonso, and not very long later was the sound of the gun going off. And once again, Marconi had proved that his equipment could send a signal without wireless a long way away. His mother, a Jameson, daughter of the famous Irish whiskey family, was fairly well known in Rome, and she decided with her son to go to Rome to see the Italian post office. The Italian post office engineers looked at the equipment and said, well, they'd already got the telephone and they weren't worried about a new piece of equipment which Marconi brought along. Mother was very furious and said, we will go off to England and we'll meet uh, Mr. Priest, the head of the British post office, and see what he thinks of the equipment. Well, Mr. Priest was impressed, but he said, there's no point in you showing me this equipment until it's properly manufactured and I can prove its capabilities. And that was the equipment which uh, Marconi had the Morse key on the right hand side, the sending equipment in the middle and the brass balls which sent a signal across the brass balls into the ether through the uh, aerial which is situated at the top. Marconi I was advised by William Priest to find a place where he could manufacture the equipment. Uh, it is not known for certain why Marconi came to Chelsea's. One could suggest he could put a pinprick on the map, but what Priest had told Marconi was find a place which is on a railway uh, track uh, from Chelsea or to London or to the coast. And it, they decided to come to Chelsea. I personally think there was another reason for it. The eventual directors of the Marconi Company in Chelmsford were mainly farmers who Marconi managed to persuade 
through his mother that they would make would grow the perfect stuff uh, for the Jameson Whiskey Company in Dublin. However, that was only a surmise. But the factory where he came to was originally a silk factory and then owned by a local company of Wendy's where they had storage facilities. And Marconi took the whole thing on and it was known as Marconi's Wireless Telegraph Company Works. This is a shot which shows the inside of the factory with a number of uh, operators. You can see the bands coming down to drive the lathes and the electric cables for the lamps. Uh, the organisation at that time employed half a dozen boys who had come straight out of school, either 11 or 12 year olds, straight into school, to train as apprentices. And according to the records, they were paid the princely sum of one shilling per week. And this is the sort of equipment which was produced there. This is a wire recorder with the uh, equipment on top of a lovely wooden box because associated with the uh, factory itself was the carpenter shop of which the boxes were made uh, before they were sent out to customers. And this is the sort of equipment, again, an amplified version of that which was shown on the first shot. And these are post office engineers sent down by William Priest to check out the equipment before uh, they accepted them in the uh, offices of the post office in London. This is a shot of another piece of equipment produced uh, by the uh, factory in Hall Street, Chelsea, and the wooden box again at the bottom, and all the other pieces, the potentiometers, etc., and the loudspeaker, and the Morse key on the top. Of course, there are headphones on the right-hand side, which uh, the operator were able to listen to the signal either coming in or going out. And this is a shot of the young Marconi at the age of 80, having started the very first factory, the wireless factory, here in the centre of Chelsea. The equipment is also modified for use on light ships. And this shot here shows, that again, the Morse key on the left-hand side and the brass balls of which the signal went across on the right-hand side. Having produced the equipment, now one has got to ensure that the people who are going to use the equipment know how to operate it. So Mark only set up a wireless school, not in Chelmsford, but at Frinton on Sea. And at number 22 Second Avenue, there is a plaque erected to announce that the first wireless uh, training school was at Frinton on Sea. Ultimately, of course, the company was able to have a much larger school, in fact, the college in Arbor Lane in Chelmsford, where engineers from overseas and the United Kingdom purchasing Marconi equipment were trained. Having produced the equipment, Marconi had to sell it to other people other than the post office. And this is an artist's impression of Marconi on Salisbury Plain, having set up the equipment to show other people like the army and the navy and embassies of the world. But at that time, of course, there was no air force. And these embassies were obviously to go back to their own countries to advise the engineering people, the equipment which Mark only had produced, which could, of course, be used in their own country. Mark only was always wanting to experiment. And this is an artist's impression of Mark only sending a signal across the Bristol Channel from North Cornwall uh, to Wales to prove that he could get a signal across water. The equipment was housed in the little huts on both sides of the water, but the kite was flown using piano wire, which acted as an arrow to send the signal across. Having proved this point, Marconi is very satisfied, and he's now attempting to cross the Atlantic Ocean, will be his next experiment. So he set up in Poldhill and Cornwall, uh, a little wireless station, the Morse key, the transmitting equipment, and a wonderful aerial array which was made up of the old style cut scaffold poles all tied together and tied back to the ground. Having satisfied himself that the aerial system was uh, operational, Marconi with his engineers went to Southampton and set off across the Atlantic Ocean, eventually to end up in Newfoundland. 
The night that Marconi left on the ship, there was a tremendous storm, and the whole of the scaffolding arrangement for the aerial collapsed. The engineers in charge decided that there was uh, no other way but to rebuild the scaffolding pole, but in a much simpler design. And this shot shows the equipment with, again, scaffold poles erected, but a very simple aerial system. There was no way of uh, telling Marconi <coughs> what had happened. He would already was on the high seas and there was no communication whatsoever. So the engineers hoped that the signal that they were going to send across to Newfoundland would be received by Marconi. Marconi took with him a number of kites, six in fact, which were made locally at the firm of H and T C Godfrey's, which is not far from the Hall Street establishment where Marconi first started work. In Newfoundland, having arrived, Marconi set up his equipment in the little hut and sent up the kites. The weather wasn't very good and five kites were blown away uh, even with their uh, piano wire connections to the aerial hut. The sixth kite, however, was successful and Marconi was able to receive signals all the way from Pole to you across the Atlantic Ocean and these are shown here on the ticker tape with Marconi on the left hand side and his chief engineer checking the equipment. That was obviously wonderful news for Marconi and he was absolutely thrilled. And this picture here shows the little hut uh, in St John's in Newfoundland which is still there today and a number of people have advised that the equipment it therein is a replica of that which Marconi used all those years ago, in, in fact in 1901. And here is a shot of Marconi's diary which records the time and the signals received all the way from Poldion Cornwall on the 2nd of December 1901. Obviously Marconi must have been absolutely thrilled to receive, receive those signals. Well, work continued at Hall Street and Marconi wanted to ensure his equipment was still operating and this shot here shows a steam bus again manufactured in Chelmsford uh, not very far from here uh, in Lower Anchor Street and this was borrowed by Marconi's uh, to go from the Blue Lion in Great Badger to the top of Danbury Hill to send signals back to the Hall Street factory which was very successful the inside of the bus shows the equipment around the bus, in those days you sat around the bus rather than behind each other as you do today. The factory at Hall Street was proving to be a little too small for Marconi so he negotiated for the purchase of a large uh, piece of land in New Street, Chelmsford, where in 14 weeks uh, he erected uh, a factory which was going to be known as his new wireless works and this shot here shows the people who built the factory in 14 weeks on scaffolding at the front of the building obviously later on the main factory itself was under construction but this was in 1912 it took two years to complete the factory and this is shows the inside of the factory with all the lights hanging on their single threads and the lathes and all the equipment which was being produced by the men in the factory. The factory was taken over in 1914 by the War Department to produce equipment for mainly for the Army and the Royal Navy. Outside of the factory Mark only directed two 450 foot towers and this shot shows the riggers who maintained the towers and in the middle a gentleman by the name of Mr. Post who used to go up on the little cradle to the top of the tower uh, each day to check the wires across because at that particular time experiments were being sent from the Marconi factory around the area of Chelmsford to prove that the equipment produced in the factory was operating successfully. Marconi ultimately wanted to lead to wireless transmission through a microphone and the, the 450 foot towers which were there at that particular time the basis of his experiments. 
next shot shows the uh, centre of Chelmsford, where Marconi's statue was right in the middle. There was around 30 outlets at, in the early days, in the 1914, when Marconi's had equipment made, particularly uh, the smaller items which were brought to the factory for uh, construction in the main equipment. In due course, after a hundred years in, with the company, there were 160 outlets of Marconi's uh, throughout Chelsea and Essex, all supplying equipment to the main factory. This shot shows uh, the uh, white star line Titanic, which sailed from Southampton to New York. And as everybody knows, the Titanic hit an iceberg. But fortunately on board were two Marconi Marine operators of the wireless equipment and of course a wireless station. And uh, whilst the Titanic hit the iceberg and was sinking, the operators were able to send signals, hopefully, to other ships nearby. But unfortunately, the nearest ship, the Carpathian, was over 50 miles away, and the operator of the equipment on the Carpathian had gone to bed. It wasn't until 6 o'clock the next day that he opened up his uh, equipment to know that uh, the Titanic hit the iceberg and was gradually sinking. Fortunately, one of the Marconi operators was saved, but the other operator went down with the Titanic. Why did the, uh, the Titanic hit an iceberg? One never knows, but because there's lots of signals sent from other ships, and this is a shot of the radiogram sent by the German ship Rika, the day before the Titanic hit the iceberg, advising the captain that there was icebergs and they gave the latitude and the longitude of the icebergs in the area where the Titanic would be sailing. It was understood at that particular time that the Titanic was on the Blue Ribbon Run, which meant to be the fastest time across the Atlantic. Whether or not the captain realised that the uh, radiograms had been sent to him or not, one never knows. This is a shot of the wireless cabin of the Titanic as it was at that particular time. Uh, all the equipment was uh, quite modern, but again, it was the use of a Morse key to send the signals rather than speech. And this is a shot, uh, which is out of punch, which shows uh, Britannia, uh, Abraham Lincoln, thanking Mr. Marconi for the equipment which he had invented for which many lives were saved by the use of this particular equipment. Here is another shot with Marconi holding the equipment which says to Neptune, I can beat you at any time. This is a shot of the first mobile phone. It was used by the British Army during the First World War. The pack horse uh, was harnessed again by equipment produced by another local firm, H&T C. Godfrey. Mm -hmm. And here's another shot which shows the harness on the right-hand side and the Marconi equipment on the left-hand side, used extensively during the First World War by the British Army. The war was over and Marconi was anxious to carry out some more experiments, but this time he wanted to have speech. There was the uh, telephone handset which carries speech across wires. Marconi wasn't interested in wires, he wanted to do something which we now know as wires. So he got together nine well-known engineers and put them together in a little army hut over at Rittle and asked them in 1919 if they, within a year, they would come up with what he called wireless broadcasting. And here's the shot of the nine engineers, including a lady, and in the middle, the senior person of the nine, Captain Peter Eckersley. And it's Peter Eckersley who was the main experimenter with the team to produce wireless through broadcasting. And this is a shot of Marconi on the left-hand side in the hut, talking to his chief engineer, Mr. Ditchin, whilst they were carrying out the experiments. Peter Eckersley used to go up to uh, Pavi Rittle uh, to borrow the piano each morning, wheel it down to the hut, 
play that on the air and read from railway timetables in an effort to utilize the use of the microphone so that people in the experimental areas all around Chelsea could hear what was going on. And this is the transmitter was used for the experiments. It's a 50 kilowatt transmitter with massive valves, which you can see at the bottom of the picture and at the top, and gigantic meters. But Ditchum, the chief engineer, experimenting with an upturned Victorian telephone handset where he has used the, the uh, microphone in to speak. And this is the equipment again in the hut. This is another shot on the left hand side. It shows the wind up gramophone, the microphone, which was invented by another Marconi engineer, and all the amplification equipment which was used to send a signal up to the aerial. In the New Street factory, when all the equipment was taken from Rittle, uh, it was installed in the front of the building and because um, Mark Hayes hadn't got anybody who uh, had a useful voice, they asked the local organisation called the Funyuns if they could send somebody to the factory for five nights whilst they carried out experiments and this person was to sing through a microphone. Well this person is here, her name was uh, Mrs. Winifred Collins and she was announced the, fir the world's first live broadcaster on air. She did carry out singing of the song called Absent for five nights, for which she was paid the princely sum of two and sixpence per night. On the fifth day, which was a Saturday, uh, Dame Nelly Melbourne, the Australian singer, was to come down and she was to take the place of Mrs. Collins to sing on air, to be the first professional broadcaster. Mrs. Collins was asked to come down, but she was not allowed to go in the studio where Dame Nelly Melbourne was. And here is a shot of Dame Nelly Melbourne with a hat and a handbag, about to sing into an upturned telephone handset, which because of her very strong voice, uh, Ditchum, the chief engineer, built uh, a little box which her voice was going through from the cigar box which he had on his desk. Dame Nelly Melba uh, came down to Chelsea in a white Rolls Royce. She could have walked. Um, the railway station to Marconi is not very far. And there she was met by Marconi and all his directors and was advised that uh, very shortly she would be the first professional singer on air in the United Kingdom. However, uh, whilst uh, the equipment uh, was being uh, operated, somebody unfortunately pulled the plug and the whole equipment collapsed and had to be uh, rehoused in another place uh, because there was a small fire. And the, all the equipment was taken to the Marconi packing sheds, which is some distance from the front building. And during that period, Dame Nelly Melbourne was shown round the factory by one of the young engineers, and there she saw all the equipment uh, being op operated on and built. And then she was taken outside to be shown the 450 foot mast. And she was advised by the young man that when she sang on air, her voice would be going from the top of that 450 foot tower right across the wires, and uh, a lot of people around the Chelsea area would hear her. It's recorded in our annals, she said to the young man, Young man, if you think I'm climbing to the top of that tower, you've got another thing coming. However, after Dame Nelly Melbourne's broadcast, there were other singers, and this shot shows Nora Scott, the United Kingdom singer, and this is the equipment on the side, you can see the uh, horn, loudspeaker, and the amplifiers on the left-hand side. Other singers in this shot, including Nora Scott, were Mel Queer, the Danish singer, and the pianist. And this uh, was used by these people uh, to use the Marconi equipment to send experimental signals uh, for a little while around the sheltered area. A lot of people seem to think that Marconi's made wireless sets, radiograms, TVs and that. They never did. The only thing they made was this shot here, which is a small crystal set. 
a very a small number was made, something like 200. You could see the uh, tearing on the right hand side and the headphones on the left hand side. All the equipment which had the name of Marconi or Marconi Graham on them was made under license, which Marconi's collected around a 10% royalty for each one that was sold. Having experimented with the equipment under uh, the code name 2MT, 2 m top, which was the original call sign, uh, the British government advised Marconi that he was monopolizing the airways and it was therefore pertinent for other people to see if they could do something with the equipment. Marconi's got a little bit upset. He said, Mike, he said that I shall leave Thompson and I'm going to London. And he set up in this building here in the middle of London, in the Old Witch, his equipment on the top floor and operated for a little while with the London signal called 2LO. And this went on for quite some time until the British government got really very upset with Marconi's and said, we are going to take over all your equipment or we are going to form an organisation called the British Broadcasting Company, later called the British Broadcasting Corporation. Not only did they take over the equipment to start the BBC, but they also took all the chief engineers and the operators as well. But the BBC never ever will recognise that Marconi's started the BBC. Marconi had a yacht called the Electra, which unfortunately is no longer operational. In fact, it's in pieces in various parts in Italy. But this is some area where he was able to carry out his experiments. And one day he said to the captain, I want you to take this piece of equipment, cover your windows with tarpaulin, and steer your boat, utilise the only piece of equipment for the signals. The captain wasn't very pleased with that situation, but did as Marconi asked, and he then steered the equipment, utilising the piece of equipment which Marconi had given to him, and it was called Blind Man's Vision. This was in the very early 30s, and I think we now know it as radar. Mark Coney carried out a lot of experiments on the River Thames in London, and this shot shows Mark Coney commandeering a lifeboat, erecting his antennas, and sending signals back to the tower on the left-hand side. Because one thing he, he always wanted to do was to ensure that he was able to send a wireless signal to, to other ships, because once the ship goes over the horizon, there's no way of contacting them whatsoever unless by a wireless signal. Wireless was used to capture a, a British criminal by the name of Crippen. A wireless ship was on board the ship sailing from uh, Southampton to New York. Uh, when the captain received the advice that there was possibility of a criminal on board the ship, uh, the captain himself didn't find the criminal, it was a passenger had reported to the captain that the lady or person behind the man with the bow hat uh, was walking rather differently to the other people. Eventually it found out that that person was a Miss Lee, which was Crippen's accomplice. The captain informed New York police using the work and his wireless equipment. They came aboard, escorted Crippen and Miss Neve, his associate, and boy, did the Mark Earning Company enjoy the publicity. And this shot shows the weekly dispatch, which shows the three people that Crippen was alleged to have uh, killed, with the captain on the right hand side, captain of the White Star Line, who took all the publicity after the event. This shows the uh, Douglas motorcycle used by the British Army at that time, with similar equipment which you saw on the pad cross. This is again Marconi equipment used extensively by the British Army. And this is the last shot we shall see of uh, Marconi at New Street uh, in his uh, office, uh, his engineering office on the right hand side, carrying out further experiments before he went back to Italy and he died in 1937. But this is one of the better equipments that he produced again for use in uh, uh, um, light ships 
And here's a one more shot with Mark Honey on the left hand side with a cap on uh, with a guy called to Scott who had a canvas covered aeroplane and Mark Honey was asking him if he would take his equipment up to experiment and send the signal back to ground. It all proves very successful, again, at that particular time, using the Morse key <coughs> as the operational source. Following from that experiment, Mark Ernest was able to supply Imperial Airways at the now defunct Croydon Airport with equipment, which he installed in the tower on the left-hand side of this shop. And after that, a number of other air companies organized themselves to purchase Marconi equipment. And this is a, a shot which uh, Marconi was deeply involved in. It was uh, mainly to send telegrams. And the telegrams themselves used to announce certain things via Marconi on the left hand side. Is a, we've got him on the list. On the right hand side, Winter Sports. Uh, also, the Derby in the centre. The British government again got upset with Marconi and saying, Marconi, you've got too many things under your belt. We're going to, uh, through uh, government, we're going to sort something out and we're going to take part of the organisation of uh, telegrams and that away from you and we're forming a new company called Cable and Wireless. And Cable and Wireless was formed out of the Marconi company and are still operating today. This shot shows the very first television set which uh, the Marconi engineers have produced. On the left hand side is a gentleman uh, sitting in front of a screen. The wooden box in the middle is the camera. On the right hand side is the operator. And that was started by Marconi in 1932. And this is a television receiver. You can see on the floor a battery and an accumulator which was driving the actual Tubes. Marconi himself is alleged to have said at that particular time, television, it will never take off. Having got themselves into television, Marconi went into operation with an organisation called EMI. And EMI produced the cameras, and you can see the cameras here on the left hand side, on what was called a dolly, that was a dolly that was pushed along, with a very thick camera cable and the person they were television, televising on the right hand side. This is the outside of the uh, EMI Marconi television outside broadcast unit. You can see the two uh, EMI cameras on the ground and one on the top of the vehicle. But all the equipment, the transmitter equipment inside is from Marconi's. They were probably televising the boat race at that particular time, 1934 or 1935. This is a shot of Alexander Palace. Again, uh, Marconi had uh, initially uh, their wireless transmitters there, and later on, of course, their uh, monochrome and colour television cameras, because that was where the BBC first started their news broadcasting. And this shot here shows the uh, transmitter and receiver, which was an all aircraft flown by the RAF to bomb Germany during the Second World War. And this is the last shot of Marconi in his office at New Street. Uh, he went back to Italy in the early part of 1937 and he died of a heart attack in Rome in July 1937. We're now coming after the war uh, to Marconi's and Marconi's were experimenting with obviously much more modern equipment. And this shot here shows the RC630 exactly radio telephone, which was pan manufactured at New Street and was utilised extensively by gas boards, water boards and electricity boards. Obviously, much later on, uh, the more modern telephone systems, which was utilised by all and sundry. But Mark Hernes went into uh, the more domestic receiver business, but only for a very short time. This shot shows Cormorant A, which is uh, an oil platform in the North Sea, 
owned by the United Kingdom, and there were many of these, and uh, showing on board Marconi tropospheric scatter equipment. Normally a signal, a microwave signal, has a maximum distance of uh, something like 30 miles in a very straight line. But this time the uh, oil platforms are something like 250 miles out into the North Sea and there's no way that you could have a straight line of 30 miles uh, to those equipments. So Marconi used the troposphere which is a 12 mile up in the air layer of which they were able to bounce a microwave signal all the way across into the North Sea. This shot here shows um, uh, the platform and the aerial for satellite communications in Victoria Island, Hong Kong, receiving signals from the United Kingdom all the way across the world to Victoria Island, Hong Kong, and then out to Australia. The little black dots up at the top are people. It gives you an indication of the size of that antenna. All the technical equipment, like this shot here, uh, which is incidentally is madly, is the sort of equipment which will be built into those brick boats underneath those uh, platforms. This shot here shows Symmetra H, which is a, a man pack equipment, uh, very much digitalized, which is used extensively by the British Army. Uh, it operates uh, where the signal changes many times per second. So there's no way the enemy could jab it or interrupt it. Not only was it sold uh, to the United Kingdom armies, but also armies overseas. This shot here is a mobile radio system shot, which was used by uh, the police, uh, the uh, fire service and the ambulance service in the United Kingdom under multi-million a pound contract from the Home Office. All the equipment, uh, and this is talking about the 80s, early 80s, uh, was owned and by the British uh, organisations, uh, not only the police forces but other organisations. But if you look into a police car nowadays, unfortunately, you'll find that most of the equipment is Japanese. This shot here shows the B1 through 6. Uh, 300 kilowatt broadcast transmitters extensively used by the BBC and many other organisations. All the equipment, uh, including the metalwork, was produced at uh, New Street utilising a Klystron, which was produced by our sister company in those days, English Electric Bell Company. The Americans used to buy these uh, transmitters uh, with power ratings of 500 kilowatt and they used to power them up to uh, uh, megawatts. The equipment used to uh, be made at New Street, it used to take something like 9 to 12 months to produce the whole equipment. It was all taken down, uh, installed in wherever the customer required, It took something like 6 months, connected up to the area and then broadcasting began. This shot shows uh, the LHD-1 combined salt ship. In England we would probably call it an aircraft carrier. And this was uh, made in the Mississippi shipyards and all the equipment a multi-million dollar contract uh, was made in Chelsea and shipped across to the United States and engineers from our companies installed all the equipment which gave ship to ship, ship to air, ship to submarine communications. This was effectively known as the GC Marconi ship. It was uh, the Type 23 figure, HMS Norfolk. It was made in the shipyards of GC in Ireland. And all the equipment on board was produced by Marconi's. At the back was the uh, platform where the helicopter lands. Was equipment there was by Marconi Aeronautical Division in Basildon. In the middle, you can see the tower with the two white bits on the left hand and right hand side. That was a satellite communication equipment made over at Stanmore by Marconi Space and Defence Systems. In the middle was the radar equipment which was made by Marconi Radar Systems and Chelsea. And right at the front, the gun sites and the guns and the gun sites were made also at uh, Stanmore by Marconi Space and Defence Systems. 
All the equipment uh, from communications, not only ship to ship, ship to shore, ship to aircraft, etc., was made by Marconi Communication Systems at New Street in Chelsea. <coughs> in the early days, the equipment had to be uh, put into the Marconi boxes uh, by soldering one item to another. The more modern uh, way of operating these days is by printed boards. And this shot shows printed boards being produced uh, by the fa in the factory by Marconi's and the larger components being inserted by ladies. There were many ladies employed by the company for this particular purpose. Later on, uh, the equipment uh, was uh, put into what was called a surface melt facility, that is a machine put all the components onto the boards and the supervision again was done by ladies. Transat, this was the uh, equipment which was used by many organisations, for instance the BBC and the ITV, if they had a, a project in overseas like Olympic Games or something similar, they took all their own equipment, their cameras, uh, and one of these transportable satellite terminals so that they could send their signals back via satellite to the United Kingdom. This is a smaller version of that, which is a news gathering equipment. Nowadays it would be a, a lot smaller, whereby an operator stood in front of a camera and his signal would be sent up to a satellite, the technical equipment or the operating on the left hand side. Again, this was all produced at the Balcony factory in New Street. This is a spy camera. In uh, the Charlton area, there are 85 of these spy cameras. And on the left hand side is a tube, which was called a Vidicon tube, it was again produced by our then sister company, English Electric Bell Company. But as digitization took place, the box on the right hand side, similar to a matchbox, was inserted into that equipment and that is the more modern version of the cameras which are used today. Well, everybody knows what that aeroplane is. Uh, it was all equipped with Marconi uh, wireless equipment produced by uh, Marconi Aeronautical Division over at Battleton. Uh, if one wants to see the, the equivalent of this today, there is one or two aircraft uh, which are grounded which are now museum pieces in the United Kingdom. Radar, this is on the Marconi experimental place over at Woodham. Uh, you can see the guy right at the top just checking the piece of good. This is made in military radar, produced by the Marconi factory in Chelsea. And this is the more modern radar, which you can see on uh, a a aircraft landing strips. And particularly Gatwick, Stansted, and Heathrow. All the technical equipment housed in the big hut underneath. And cameras, well, Marconi's produced uh, cameras from Mark 1, which is the back and white camera, right the way through to color cameras to the Mark 9 studio camera, which you can see here, extensively used by many organizations throughout the world, including the big. This is the last shot of Marconi in 1937 uh, in his office in Utrecht before he returned to Italy in Rome where he died in July 1937.